Did you know that Mark Zuckerberg uses Signal? How do we know, you ask? Well, in early 2021, Facebook got hacked, which leaked the phone numbers, names, locations, and email addresses of 530 million people. One of the affected users was Mark Zuckerberg himself, and after cross-checking his number on Signal, it was clear that Mark had a Signal account. This has sparked hundreds of theories online about how Mark himself doesn't trust WhatsApp. To be honest though, most of these theories are quite overblown. The bottom line is that Mark probably does have a Signal account like the leak suggests, but that doesn't mean that he uses it over WhatsApp. As a good CEO that's in the know, he was probably just checking out the competition. But while Mark may not have switched teams, someone else notable did. WhatsApp's founders themselves. If you didn't know, Signal was actually founded by WhatsApp's co-founder, Brian Acton. After selling WhatsApp to Facebook and seeing what Facebook was doing to the platform, Brian decided that the only way to do messaging right was as a nonprofit. And that's why he created Signal in 2018. So here's the story of Signal, if you should switch, and whether Signal actually has a chance at taking on WhatsApp. Signal has only recently started making media headlines, but the effort to create a secure messenger can actually be traced all the way back to 2010 to a security researcher named Moxie Marlinspike. By this point, Moxie was in his late 20s and he had spent his entire adult life exposing security vulnerabilities in big tech products. In 2002, for example, he published a paper that exposed the security vulnerabilities of SSL and he would call out Internet Explorer for shipping with these security risks. He would even go on to call out the privacy-centric iPhone, which at one point was vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. Most people probably never heard about any of this, but these exposés made Moxie somewhat of a security legend behind the scenes, which gave him the street cred to create his own security startup called Whisper Systems in 2010. Immediately after being founded, Whisper Systems would launch two products called TechSecure and Redphone. These applications were pretty straightforward. TechSecure offered encrypted texting, and Redphone offered encrypted calling. Whisper Systems also created a firewall and ways to encrypt other forms of data, which quickly caught the attention of an up-and-coming social media startup. No, not Facebook, but actually Twitter. Within just two years of being founded, Whisper Systems would be acquired by Twitter for an undisclosed amount, which was probably less than $10 million. Moxie was probably hoping that he could help transform Twitter into being the private encrypted social media network, but it seems that Twitter had different plans. You see, Twitter very much valued Moxie's security expertise. That's why they acquired Whisper Systems and made Moxie Twitter's head of cybersecurity. They wanted an expert take on all of the security practices at Twitter. Twitter would even help Moxie re-release TechSecure and Redphone as free open source software. But when it came to completely uprooting Twitter's existing products to make them encrypted, well, Twitter wasn't exactly a big fan. After unsuccessfully trying to convince Twitter to encrypt key products like DMs, Moxie would leave Twitter in early 2013 and basically restart his startup. This time, the project was called Open Whisper Systems, or OWS, and as the name suggested, it was an open source community project. The project was funded by grant money, which was used to pay a core team of engineers, and everything else was developed by the community. This effort would once again gain quite a bit of traction within the tech world and garner the attention of an up-and-coming social media startup, and this time, it was Facebook, or more specifically, WhatsApp. In late 2014, WhatsApp would announce a massive partnership with OWS. Unlike Twitter, WhatsApp was actually willing to uproot all of their existing infrastructure to implement end-to-end -end encryption on all WhatsApp text messages. This meant that not even Zuckerberg himself could access your WhatsApp messages. And around the same time, Apple would implement similar encryption on iPhones such that not even Apple themselves can read the data on them. These two events basically set off a wave of encryption across the valley, and the go-to partner to implement these security standards was none other than OWS. They would go on to help implement encryption for Google Messages, Facebook Messenger, and Skype. So as you can see, Moxie was at the forefront of massive security and privacy pushes long before he founded Signal. But if all of these big tech companies had already implemented this technology, what was the problem? Why did Moxie feel a need to create Signal? Well, it turns out that behind the scenes, big tech encryption was a lot more nuanced.
While it was true that WhatsApp had integrated end-to-end -end encryption and that Zuck himself couldn't read your messages, that didn't mean that your data was safe from monetization. And the only reason that we know this is because of WhatsApp's co-founder, Brian Acton, who decided to defect from Facebook without signing an NDA. The story goes that after encryption was implemented into WhatsApp, Mark asked Brian to start laying the groundwork for showing targeted ads and supporting commercial messaging on WhatsApp. This was naturally confusing to Brian. Sure, you could definitely build an encrypted messaging platform with ad targeting abilities, but it seemed that encryption and targeted ads were on two completely different ends of the spectrum. So Brian proposed a different mode of monetization. They could just charge heavy WhatsApp users a few cents based on their usage. Not only was this a far simpler solution given that you didn't have to build out a massive ads platform and attract advertisers and build targeting algorithms and all of that, but it would be decently lucrative. Given the scale of WhatsApp, even charging just a few cents per month could generate hundreds of millions and even billions per year. But Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg would immediately shoot down the idea by saying, quote, it won't scale. This remark angered Brian, who lashed back, no, you don't mean that it won't scale, you mean that it won't make as much money as… and that was it. Both parties knew exactly where the other stood, and Brian would say, well, you want me to do these things I don't want to do. It's better if I get out of your way. And fortunately for Brian, there was a way out. The WhatsApp acquisition had a clause that Brian could leave Facebook without losing out on stock compensation if Facebook began implementing monetization efforts without their consent. But Brian would quickly realize that it was going to be a lot harder to actually leverage this clause. In his next meeting with Zuckerberg, Zuck's lawyer would be present, who told Brian that Facebook was simply exploring monetization avenues with WhatsApp, not implementing them, so the clause was not valid. Zuckerberg would end the meeting by telling Brian, this is probably the last time you'll ever talk to me. Realizing that this was just going to turn into one massive court battle, Brian would decide to give up $850 million in stock comp and walk away. With all of that being said, Brian is still clear in saying that no one at Facebook is particularly a bad person. It's just that their number one job is to be business people and run the business as profitably as possible. And naturally, that often conflicts with what's best for users. He doesn't try to make himself the hero either. He thinks that he's just as bad as Facebook given that he sold out, making billions in the process. But now that he already had his billions, he wanted to do something just for the sake of good. He didn't exactly know what that was though until early 2018. This is when the Cambridge Analytica story broke, exposing how Facebook data collection could be used for political manipulation. After seeing the story, it was clear to Brian what he had to do. He was going to start a movement against Facebook. He would take to Twitter with quote, It is time. Hashtag delete Facebook. And around the same time, he would connect with Moxie Marlin Spike, leading to the creation of Signal. On February 21st, 2018, Moxie and O'Brien would announce the creation of the Signal Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to democratizing messaging. The organization was funded using 50 million from Brian, which eventually grew to 100 million from Brian. This was sort of a match made in heaven. You had Moxie, one of the leaders of cybersecurity, and you had Brian, one of the main guys who helped scale WhatsApp to billions of users. Not to mention, he also had billions to fund Signal with. For privacy enthusiasts, this was exactly the messaging platform that they were looking for, and Signal would garner some pretty high-profile supporters. This included the likes of Edward Snowden, Elon Musk, and as we touched on, even Mark Zuckerberg, though Zuck is more of a shadow supporter. All of this hype allowed Signal to grow to a solid 40 million users over the past several years, but that's only a fraction of WhatsApp's 2.7 billion users. So should you join the Signal movement and ditch WhatsApp? And what exactly are the benefits of Signal? Well, ironically, there is no quantifiable difference between Signal and WhatsApp. Some Signal activists will tell you that Signal has better UI or faster speeds or more privacy, but none of that is really true. You see, after the launch of Signal and the Cambridge Analytica scandal, Facebook decided to completely backtrack on their WhatsApp monetization plans and it basically turned it into a non-profit themselves, at least for everyday users. They've shifted their monetization efforts to business users who have to pay based on their usage. 
Turns out that Zuckerberg would rather give up consumer monetization altogether when the alternative is to lose users to Signal. So the reality is that you will not get better encryption or security or even privacy by switching to Signal. But that's not to say that there isn't a difference. Given that WhatsApp has matched Signal's business model, the appeal for Signal is a lot more qualitative. While WhatsApp and Signal are offering essentially the exact same product, the intent is completely different. WhatsApp is offering these perks to maximize user retention and keep WhatsApp relevant. Signal, on the other hand, is offering these perks because it's the right thing to do. So the choice between WhatsApp and Signal is not a matter of what's the better messaging platform, but rather, which messaging do you resonate with? Most users probably don't know and don't care, so it's up to the people who do know, which now includes you, to potentially accelerate a change. And that brings us back to the hook of the video, which is that Zuckerberg himself uses Signal. Honestly, this is kind of a meme at this point, but peeling back the layers, there is a notable point here. Either Mark truly prefers Signal over WhatsApp, which would be crazy, or more probably, he was investigating the competition, which is also an important point to note. The only reason that someone at Zuck's level checks out the competition is if they think the competition is a serious threat. So it's quite likely that Mark sees Signal as a serious threat, and as a stellar businessman, you can bet that Mark has been doing everything within his power to defuse this threat. That's why he completely pivoted WhatsApp's monetization effort. So the question really becomes, are you okay with Mark's band-aid solution with WhatsApp, or would you rather use a platform that's actually trying to address the real issues at hand? Let me know down below where you stand. Another instance of a big tech company secretly using an open source solution is Microsoft and Linux. Check out this video to learn more, but until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.